Welcome to Non-Obvious with Hugh Hansen. And welcome, Jed Rakoff. Uh, delighted to have you here. Uh, I think everyone probably who's listening to this knows uh, a lot about Jed, but he's an amazing person on so many levels. Um, does so many different things. It's, uh, it's almost crazy, uh, but wonderful. But we're going to go through those um, and uh, try to have a good time as well. Okay, so apparently you were born in Philadelphia and lived in a place called Germantown. How is that? That is correct. Uh, a uh, very old neighborhood. Um, uh, if you walk the streets of the Germantown part of Philadelphia, you will see plaques that point out this was where um, Washington was defeated. This is where uh, another uh, American general was defeated in the revolution. Um, uh, uh, and we're all very proud of the fact that somehow we survived despite all yeah. those defeats. Yeah, I think it must be in Ripley. The most defeats and then actually winning it at the end. Uh, uh, Okay, so uh, your dad was a doctor, your mom was a school teacher, and you have been quoted as saying the marriage was not only happy, but downright delightful. That's wonderful. I am, um, are you talking about my marriage, which is? Your marriage, well, uh, we'll get to your marriage but, later but, on. But my, pa yes, my parents, I, I owe everything in my life to my parents. I had two, fantastic parents. They were not only uh, deeply devoted to each other, but also to their three sons. Um, and uh, the, uh, this is perhaps a cliche, uh, but there is no part of my uh, being that is not just simply a reflection of what they taught me. Well, one of the traits, and I, I guess this Maybe it came from your mother, or both of them, but the speak up for the powerless. So the um, uh, that was definitely from both of them. They were both uh, children of immigrants. Um, the my father's family was uh, uh, for many generations uh, tailors. Uh, I cannot, by the way, sew a, a lick, but anyway, uh, and uh, uh, my. What my, my mother's father, uh, though originally a pharmacist during the depression became a grave digger. Uh, so these were not wealthy people, and, but they uh, scrimped and saved to uh, send uh, respectively my father and my mother uh, to college at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, it was no easy, task for them to do that, but um, the, uh, I could tell you stories all day about both my uh, parents, um, but I'll give you just one that you might find interesting. It's about my mother. When my mother was seven years old. The city of Philadelphia in the public schools did a test of all the second grade students um, to to determine who had scientific aptitude. Um, and my mother scored number one in the entire city. So they then came to her and said, fantastic, we'd like to put you into all sorts of special courses to foster your scientific learning. And my grandmother, my mother's mother, said, absolutely not. She'll never get a husband if she becomes a scientist. <laughs> so, you know, we've come a long way, thank, thank, thankfully. Uh, since well, the realist aspects uh, to that, um, perhaps. Um, so, high school, captain of the debating team, that sort of fits. Was that fun? It was a lot of fun. And I think it's the reason I got into... Uh, Swarthmore College because uh, when I got there, they told me that they were desperate for people on their debate team. They wanted to revise it. And I said, 
well, I'm not really interested. <laughs> I've been there, done that. Uh, uh, but they didn't throw me out. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it was a lot of fun in, in high school. I went to an all boys high school. And uh, when I got to, even though it was a public school, it was all male. Uh, and uh, when I got to sophomore, sophomore is 50 50 co ed. And unlike, unlike some Johnny come lately schools like Harvard or Yale, uh, sophomore was co ed from 1864. Um, founded in part by the great feminist Lucretia Mott. Uh, and um, uh, it was to me uh, a great eye-opening um, to have um, so many women in my class who were so bright, so uh, devoted to uh, intellectual pursuits and things like that, all of whom undoubtedly existed in um, High schools in Philadelphia, but I had never met them before. Yeah, that's, that's actually interesting. Now, uh, you worked in, is this from in high school? You worked uh, for the Congress of Racial Equality? And, no, that uh, was in, that was in uh, college. And that, uh, you, you'll cut me off when I start telling too many stories, but uh, the, so, uh, I went to sophomore from 1960 to 64, which was the uh, period when there was very intense civil rights activity in the United States. And I was very interested in being part of that. And so in the summer of 64, um, I went to the Congress of Racial Equality, which was a wonderful civil rights organization then headed uh, by James Farmer, uh, a, a superb leader. And I said, I'd like to get involved. And I was hoping they would send me to like Mississippi or Louisiana. And they said, great, we're going to send you this summer to San Francisco. I said, San Francisco, that hotbed of racism. Uh, uh, and they said, there is increasing evidence that there is severe employment discrimination on the part of those large companies and financial institutions that are based in San Francisco. And we want to open up that aspect of the civil rights movement. And so I went to San Francisco and worked all summer for the Congress of Racial Equality. And we were focused on Bank of America. Um, which in those days uh, well, had many, many, it was the largest bank in San Francisco, but it had many, many branches, including branches in predominantly uh, black communities where every uh, employee was white. Um, so we picketed and uh, tried to bring this to public attention and we were not getting anywhere. So finally, we decided towards the middle of August that we would stage a sit-in and go to one of the branches uh, in, in, in one of these uh, ghetto communities, uh, sit down on the floor, and the thought, we th our thought would be that would uh, uh, either lead to our arrest <laughs> or at least to some uh, attention being paid. So we went into this branch singing We Shall Overcome and we sat down and the manager came out and said, uh, you know, I'm really glad you're here. Um, I totally agree with what you're doing. Um, there's, uh, I've been trying myself to convince the hierarchy to hire more Black employees, um, why, why don't you stay? We close at three o'clock, but you can stay as long as you want. We'll leave, but you can always get out. Uh, the, the door, you can't get back in, but you can leave. Uh, and meantime, could I offer you some coffee? Uh, 
<laughs> this was not what we expected. Um, so after a little uh, uh, discussion among ourselves, we marched out. Um, fast forward to four years ago when I was giving the commencement address at Hastings Law School. And I told this story because Hastings is in San Francisco. And in the audience was the guy who had been the manager of that branch. And he came, oh. and he came up to see me afterwards. And we both recognized one another. Uh, he told me that, in fact, Bank of America has done much, much better in subsequent years. But um, anyway, what a coincidence. Yeah, that's a great story. Um, okay, so then you get the, for some reason, you go over to Oxford and study Indian history. Um, and your master's thesis is, is on Mohandas Gandhi, AKA Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, so how did all this happen? So um, my uh, favorite professor at Swarthmore was a guy named Harry Wright who taught British empirical his, uh, imperial history. Uh, and I took his seminar and got very, very interested in Gandhi. A great many of the uh, methodologies and ideas that Martin Luther King Jr. brought to the civil rights movement really derived from Gandhi's earlier work uh, in India. Um, and um, I applied to Oxford. They had um, a unusual, Balliol College where I went had an unusual um, scholarship called the Wadi Scholarship and I was fortunate enough to get it and um, went there and wasn't quite sure uh, exactly what I wanted to do, but I uh, hooked up uh, very shortly after I got there with uh, Jack Gallagher, a uh, professor of Indian history. And he said, why don't you look at the question that has bothered a lot of people, which is that how was it that before Gandhi, the Indian nationalist movement was totally an elitist movement, mainly Brahmin lawyers. Uh, and after Gandhi, and within a matter of years, he transformed it into a mass movement and uh, you should look into, as some others already have, but there's plenty of room there for innovation as to how he was able to accomplish that. So that's what I wrote my uh, thesis. And uh, have you followed up on, is st it still an interest to you and you're following up on Indian politics or what? I, I um, try to keep track of India as much as I can and I, um, still uh, email with some folks I know uh, in India and through them try to keep track the, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, it. India has every problem known to mankind and yet it works. It somehow manages to be a working democracy um, uh, uh, even though it has unbelievable number of divisions economic divisions, caste divisions, religious divisions, you name it. Um, uh, and, and I do attribute that in part, once again, to Gandhi. Gandhi um, was uh, as close as I think we have seen in uh, the last two centuries to a saint-like figure, and mm. that conveyed a lot. What about... Any similarities that you see uh, with Gandhi and uh, Martin Luther King? Yes, I think Martin Luther King drew many of his ideas from Gandhi. Uh, the most important being civil disobedience. So um, the uh, idea is, if you think a particular law is unjust, you should openly disobey that law in a way that, you know, you're not hiding it at all, but you should be, should be totally prepared to take the consequences. The object is uh, not to evade your legal responsibility, but to demonstrate by 
the force of your own um, actions, just how unjust this law is. Um, and of course, that was carried over uh, by Martin Luther King to the sit-ins and uh, other activities of the civil rights movement. Uh, but it was really Gandhi who first developed it. Yeah, uh, actually, Martin Luther King actually, I have two heroes and a sort of trite in the sense that at least when I had them, one is George Washington and one is Martin Luther King and both had upper middle class lives, all the money Martin Luther King could have inherited his father church, another church, he goes out and does all these wonderful things. George Washington, money, status, and becomes the general of an army which was almost defeated in every single battle and the bravery, both of them, I respect tremendous. It was personal courage, uh, not just moral courage, but personal courage. And Washington led right into the enemy. And Martin Luther King was going against these horrible things going on in the South uh, that uh, could actually kill people and actually killed him. So um, it's, it's anyway, uh, I think it, people like that are tremendous people to think about uh, as role models. Anyway, uh, okay, go to Harvard and then you uh, clerked with uh, Judge Friedman of the Third Circuit. Uh, now, that's in Philadelphia, right? Yes, and I was at that point in time thinking of possibly practicing in Philadelphia. Uh, Judge Friedman, who unfortunately died just a couple of years later at a fairly young age, was in my view, the best judge on the Third Circuit at the time, and there were some very good ones. Uh, and um, so I was thrilled to have the opportunity to clerk for him. And what did you get from that experience? Well, several things. Um, first, uh, uh, the Judge Friedman spent so much time crafting his opinions so that they would be convincing both to lawyers and fellow judges, but also to the general public. And I thought um, that uh, that uh, was a very valuable thing for him to do. He, he recognized that judges have more than one audience, so to speak. Um, the second thing was he was so much smarter than me that when he took me out to lunch on my last day of clerking, um, uh, I said to him, gee, Judge Friedman, after watching you, I think maybe I shouldn't be a lawyer at all. You're, 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 so, much, you're so much better a lawyer than I will ever be. Uh, maybe I should go do something else. And, and he was kind enough to say, um, experience is everything. And, uh, uh, you'll get there. And I don't know if I ever got to his level, but I uh, certainly took heart for what he told me. I, I decided in the end to go to New York. I had always loved New York, but there was a hidden motive. Uh, in law school, I had written uh, the book and lyrics for several uh, student musicals, and I had sort of gotten very interested in that. And my uh, the, the guy, uh, George Selden, who wrote the uh, music, uh, we decided we would both go to New York, work for large law firms, and in the evening we would write the great American musical. What we had not realized was that in a big New York law firm, even then in the evening, you're at the law firm. Uh, we never carried it that uh, goal, but the uh, uh, but I Deba Voice was a very fine firm, still is, and um, uh, I liked it a lot. Uh, love the people, um, uh, but I did find the work of a litigator there. Um, forgive me, somewhat boring. Um, so I only stayed a couple of years and went to the U.S. Attorney's Office. All right. So, how did you pick the U.S. Attorney's Office as the next place to go? So I had heard correctly that that was a place where you could um, get real trial experience. It was nothing more exalted than that. Uh, when I applied, they said, 
by the way, there's a th make a three year commitment. And I thought, gee, um, three years, I'm not sure I want, I want the experience. So that seems, you know, at that tender age, a lot, a lot of time. After I arrived, um, I would say within one week, I recognized that this is one of the great jobs uh, that anyone could ever have. Uh, and I stayed for uh, over seven years and I would have stayed more if economics had uh, allowed it. Um, so I changed my mind almost instantly. But the real reason I went there originally was just the trial experience. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I, we probably learned about that type of experience from clerking, seeing those. And, and I, I also clerked. I clerked in the Southern District Second Circuit. And it, to me, is being in AUSA was a, a wonderful experience. And uh, I went to the Southern District. Actually, I think I ran into it in the hall once. Um, and um, just for that purpose is to try cases. And unfortunately, my brother had a... Uh, traumatic brain injury that uh, forced me to, in about seven months, leave and to take care of him. Uh, uh, but in that short amount of time, and also because it w moved to the individual assignment system at the same time, so all of a sudden, these all these judges are getting the whole world. They don't have anybody to help them. And the AUSA says, we'll have another case in the past they would just say okay we'll delay it or do something else this time it's said too bad get someone else in the office uh, so here i am in the newbie baby crimes and are drifting down completely prepared a serious cases so in a period of about four months i i tried yeah, four cases that's, for that is and, the and the uh, i didn't mean to interrupt but and what you say is what was one of the really wonderful aspects of the office. It's unfortunate through no fault of the assistants that jury trials are much more sparse today. Uh, but in those days, you could easily have uh, a trial every month. Yeah, that's fantastic. All right. So then at some point, you met this person called Ann R. But when was that? Well, that's a sort of embarrassing story. Uh, the I was dating her roommate, um, and um, one night um, uh, uh, I, when I went to pick up Kathy, um, I met for the first time Anne, and uh, it was truly love at first sight. Uh, uh, I didn't believe in that before then, but boy. It, it happened instantaneously, uh, and uh, she's kind enough to say it happened at her end as well. Um, so that very night, um, I said to Kathy, do you mind if I date your roommate? <laughs> uh, and she was polite enough. She never spoke to me much after that, but she was polite enough to uh, accept that. Um, you know my wife. Um, but and therefore you know i had the most fantastic wife ever i hit the jackpot she is so sweet she is so intelligent she is so helpful to others um uh, she she uh i put her up in the same category uh with the others she is really something special and an incredibly hard worker including work that she did at your institution for yeah no, I, I totally agree as a person on every level, and it's just fantastic. So, uh, the land, so three daughters, two grandsons, what are they all doing? So my oldest daughter is a school teacher. Uh, in a moment of weakness, she married a lawyer. Um, and uh, they live on the Upper East Side and, and uh, 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 have two uh, fantastic sons, uh, ages six and four, uh, and my wife and I uh, feel very lucky that they're so close so we can spend a lot of time with them. My middle daughter is a uh, teacher and graduate student at Indiana University doing her PhD 
in the history of medicine. Um, and she has been, because of the pandemic, living with us since middle of March. And that's been another blessing because we otherwise don't get to see her more than once in a while. Um, my youngest daughter is the adventuresome one of the family. Uh, she uh, lives in Paris with her um, longtime boyfriend who um, uh, we keep hoping will be more than a boyfriend, but uh, he's French, so, you know, what does he care? Um, so in any event, um, uh, so she's been having, she's been there for two years and she's been having the time of her life. She does have not one, but two jobs. Uh, she is both a business person and a clinical psychologist. That's fantastic. Well, okay. So eventually you found yourself to be a federal judge uh, since 1996. Uh, how would you sum up that experience if you can uh, today? Or maybe you can't, but if you can. No, I think it is even a better job than being an AUSA uh, or being a criminal defense lawyer, which I also enjoyed very much uh, between the time I left the U.S. Attorney's Office and when I went to the uh, went on the bench. The reason being a judge is such a great job is for several reasons. First, you get to say what you think. One problem in an adversary system of law is that you have to make on behalf of your clients the best argument you can make for them. It may not be what deep in your heart you really think. As a judge within the limits of the law, but those law limits are considerably broad, you can say what you think and you can decide what you think. And that's a great freeing uh, experience. Secondly, as a district judge, a trial judge, I get to take the first crack at new issues. Ultimately, of course, uh, the courts of appeals or the Supreme Court may agree or disagree with what I decide. But it's the trial judges who get to take the first crack at new issues. And that's a very um, thrilling experience as well, and somewhat intimidating in many cases. Um, and the third thing I would say is um, that because I'm a trial judge, um, I get to see what I really, uh, uh, one of the things I really love, which is trials. Um, and while again, this has decreased somewhat, um, I've been fortunate and I've had an average of 12 trials a year, every year up to this year, the pandemic it'll be fewer. Uh, but uh, so so that's kept me um, busy, but also uh, very involved. How many of those are jury trials? How many are judge trials? Uh, two thirds are jury trials, one third are judge trials. Uh, you have a Yes, yeah, so I love jury trials I, for, for, for two opposite reasons. One is because I have tremendous respect for the jury system. I think the jury system, contrary to what some people think, is one of the great inventions of the Anglo-American legal system. Uh, you take uh, 12 people, or in a civil case, maybe eight people um, uh, from all walks of life, um, and you give them something very serious to do, and they take it very seriously which is the determination of where justice lies in a particular situation. And um, I talk to juries after every case. I've now had over 300 trials. I've talked to over 300 jur juries. Um, and I am always impressed at how seriously and conscientiously they take their role. Um, the other advantage of a jury trial is it's less work for the judge. <laughs> That's the, <laughs> the second <laughs> reason I like it, uh, because in a bench trial, I have to make specific findings of fact and conclusions of law, which takes a while to do. All right. How many times 
Did you actually agree with the result of the jury? All but twice out of more than 300 cases. Wow. Uh, and in the two times, um, I uh, uh, reduced the two times for both civil cases, not criminal cases. And I reduced the verdict in both the cases. I thought the verdict was um, much too high based on the evidence. And the judge is given the power to reduce it. And I did. Occasionally in criminal cases, I will see an acquittal of a lower level defendant where the evidence against that defendant is really quite overwhelming. But what's going on there is the jury saying, oh, as compared to the other people who they have just convicted, this guy is a schnuck. This guy is uh, a, a really minor figure and they have some sympathy for him. And I'm not sure that's wrong. I don't, say, I don't really necessarily disagree with that. Uh, uh, but that's as close as I've come to any form of disagreement in a criminal case. All right, how many of the 300 were criminal? How many were civil? Uh, it was about 60% um, uh, criminal, 40% civil. Yeah. In terms of the lawyers appearing before you, you've been a judge for, I don't know, 24, 24 years or something like that? It'll be 25 this coming March, yes. Okay. Uh, quality of the, the attorneys, any change over that time? No change. The, the, we are so blessed in the Southern District of New York that we have such a terrific group of attorneys. Um, I, uh, now that I'm what's called a senior judge, I get to sit on other courts. Usually that's courts of appeals, typically like the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. But I also occasionally will try cases uh, in other district courts. And the uh, when I talk to the judges in these other places, they always say, gee, the best lawyers we've seen are the ones who came out here from New York uh, on this case or that case. Um, we have a, an outstanding bar in the Southern District of New York, and it makes the judges job so much easier. Yeah, I actually do think there's something to be said. Uh, you know, when I would, I, uh, I, teaching law but sometimes i do consulting i have a case and then maybe have a california part a new york part or maybe in a european part and in terms of really the rigor intellectual rigor put into a case i was surprised that i took it for granted in new york but i was surprised how much for instance was compared to some you know pretty good california firms and uh it's something we take for granted, but uh, as you say, I think it's actually true. But on the other hand, California, they go out hiking more than they do in New York. And so maybe uh, maybe you have to balance a little more, I don't know. So I tried a case about 10 years ago uh, in Fresno, California, uh, a jury trial. Uh, they were, the, the chief judge there was a little bit uh, under the weather, and so he invited me to come out and try a case. And uh, what I didn't know until I arrived there was that uh, July in Fresno is not a place one would normally volunteer to be. It's hot. It's the air quality there is uh, really pretty bad. Um, the uh, it's a, a economically depressed area. Um, but it's only a two hour drive from Yosemite. And so each weekend, I was there for three weeks each weekend, I went out and hiked in Yosemite and that made it all worthwhile, I assure you. Okay, do you, do you hike any time you're in New York um, area? Much less than, than um, I used to. My wife and I used to take our three daughters on camping trips every every single uh, summer, uh, usually to places like national parks, some sometimes state parks in New York, um, and um, I, I will tell you, there's nothing, there's no true togetherness 
until you have five people in a single tent. Uh, the, uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, my wife is still a very serious walker. And she, even during the pandemic, uh, typically averages uh, about 20,000 steps a day. And she knows that because she has one of those things you put on your arm that, that measures the number of steps. How many miles is 20,000 steps? I think it's about, she's told me, and I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it's about six miles. Uh, okay, that's a lot. The, uh, uh, but it may be more. But the, um, uh, un unfortunately, I can't even try to compete with her, don't want to compete with her. Uh, I do a little walking, uh, uh, but serious hiking, I'm afraid, is in the past, except that my wife and I have a hobby. Uh, which is ballroom dancing, and we do that twice a week. And where do you do that? Well, right now we're doing it remotely, uh, but before the pandemic, we did it in two places. The place where we took lessons is the Arthur Murray, Murray Studio, which is at uh, 82nd and Columbus, and then we would also go to uh, various dance clubs. So, for example, uh, swing dancing is one kind of dance we enjoy a lot. There's a place called Swing 46 on 46th Street. So we would go uh, there regularly. Um, I worry, about, there are a whole bunch of these places. I worry about how they're surviving the yeah. pandemic. But, um, the, the, but that's, so we, 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 in a typical week, we would usually go to Arthur Berry two times a week and then once a week to a club. Well, between the walking, the hiking, the ballroom dancing, your resting heart rate must be like six or something. Yeah? <laughs> the, well, my doctor actually partly recommended all this because uh, my father died of a heart attack. So my doctor, of course, is concerned, of, you know, whether there's a hereditary uh, issue uh, there. Um, although... As I mentioned, my, all, all the males before my doctor, before my father were tailors and I've inherited none of that, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, okay. Apparently you're, you're, you're a big champion of moral arguments. Now, let me just preface that is, uh, when I was clerking, every case you had oral argument, district court, court of appeals, uh, now there's so many courts that limit oral argument and especially uh, district court judges. Well, if I'm, I'll tell you whether I want oral argument. Uh, I think it's a loss, but the, apparently the trend is against it. But you're saying actually that's a bad trend. There should be more oral argument. Is that correct? That's totally correct. Um, for two different reasons. First, Maybe my colleagues are a lot more smarter than I am, probably they are. But after I've read the briefs, I often have some material questions to ask. And oral argument is my opportunity to ask those questions. And they can be case dispositive. Not in every case, maybe only in 10% of the cases, but not a trivial number either. Secondly, I think that the lawyers often feel that, yeah, I've made my good argument on the briefs, but I haven't yet been able to really get through to the judge the heart of why uh, he or she should rule in my favor. And so oral argument is their chance to have that experience. Sometimes they succeed, sometimes they don't. Uh, but I feel that uh, for them, it's almost part of due process. Um, uh, they want that added uh, opportunity to really connect with the judge if they can and to persuade him or her of their point of view. Yeah, actually, uh, it's interesting because in various things, whether it's a PTO, uh, some things in a copyright office or uh, other courts, um, there's for instance, you can in a TTAB or whatever go and have an oral argument and most people just waive it. 
uh, which I think is a terrible mistake. Now they, they claim, well, the client doesn't want to pay. Well, how much money you could do it for free? And, and um, so, uh, and, I, and I know judges in your court and all who actually think it's not worth their time to hear. Yep, I, I a, a, a prominent judge in my court, I will not identify him, but uh, uh, almost never has oral art. And I asked him about it once, and he said, uh, once I get through the briefs, I know how I'm coming out. Uh, it would just be, I'd be deluding them to think that I hadn't decided uh, how the case is going to come out. That's not been my experience, uh, uh, but, but, you know, that is the view. It's also impacted by the workload, um, you know, uh, to have a serious oral argument. I rarely have an oral argument that is less than a half hour, and I've had oral arguments that have gone on for two hours, and, uh, you know, that's time that could be spent on other matters. Um, the, uh, so, so, uh, I am so fortunate in that I have brilliant law clerks that keep me current, so I've never had a huge backlog that I've had to worry about. Uh, but that is a problem for some judges. So how much, all right, a case comes in. You've been seeing cases now for almost 25 years. How many times you say, I, I almost immediately, you know how you're going to go in that case? A civil, I'm talking civil yeah. case. I would say... One in 20 or less, very low percentage. And that's because of experience. When I first became a judge, the answer to your question might have been, oh, one out of every five or something like that. But I've learned in case after case after case, that first impressions can be deceiving. And that cases that look like they're almost frivolous turn out to be for real. Cases that look like they're slam dunks turn out to have serious legal problems. Um, uh, so I don't even these days uh, attempt to draw a uh, first impression um, because I've learned from experience that it can so often be wrong. So do you feel that oral argument, therefore, is more important in the district court than, for instance, in the Court of Appeals? Definitely. Um, although I still think it plays an important role in the, in the Court of Appeals. I've sat many times now on the Court of Appeals. Um, and um, the uh, uh, I won't say that it's changed my mind as often as it sometimes has in the district court. But there definitely have been cases where I changed my mind or even where my mind was made up and changed the mind of the other judges. Um, so, so it's still very important. I think it's unfortunate that because of the size of the docket, um, oral arguments in the Court of Appeals tend to be um, much too short uh, because they've got a lot of cases they've got to get through. Uh, but typically in the second circuit, for example, both sides are given maybe 10 minutes. Mm. Um, the best argument I ever had in a court of in the second circuit court of appeals when I was a defense lawyer was against a fella uh, who was at that time the US attorney for the Southern District of New York named Rudy Giuliani. And partly because it was the US attorney, they allowed us to argue for two hours. And that was great. That was wonderful. We covered every single issue. Of course, I'm telling you this story because I won the case, but the, uh, uh, the, it was really what an argument should be. Oh, that's great. Uh, quality of oral arguments, because it, a lot of Fewer lawyers are doing them on a consistent basis. Uh, has the quality gone down or is it as good as it used to be? Quality is as good as it used to be. Uh, I think the uh, biggest issue uh, 
that is faced uh, uh, if you are a big firm lawyer is whether you should be doing the argument or some junior partner or senior associate who actually knows the case much better should be doing the argument. And the uh, too often, I think the senior partner does it partly, I know from experience when I was a senior partner, because that's what the client expects. Um, uh, but uh, uh, my experience is that uh, there have been many times at oral argument where the senior partner was doing the argument and I asked a uh, uh, complicated question and he or she had to turn to her to the associate or junior partner who was sitting there at council table to get the answer. Uh, and it would have been so much more effective uh, if uh, he or she could have given the answer uh, right off the top. A further aspect of this, which I'm glad to say is beginning to change, but is that there have historically been far fewer women giving the lead oral argument in um, cases before the judges of my court and other courts because while women have become uh, maybe a majority of the lawyers now, they certainly are the majority in law schools, um, they still haven't made it in those percentages to the rank of senior partners. Uh, but if the uh, object is to win the case and the junior lawyer, whether it be man or woman, uh, is the one who really did the work, that's the person who you should have arguing at a oral argument. I totally agree with you on that. Uh, all right, a little broader, I'll get more specific uh, maybe later, but the, the state of the U.S. part today, I'm getting the sense that it's much more of a business now than a profession, and also often run with marketing people or other people rather than the lawyers. Do you agree with that? I totally agree with that, and it's, uh, I think, widely recognized and most unfortunate. Um, the you know, why did we all become lawyers as opposed to investment bankers or whatever? Uh, it's because we had a thirst for justice. We wanted to be professionals. We wanted the respect that others would accord us and that we would accord ourselves uh, for being people who were uh, in uh, ways either large or small uh, furthering the cause of justice, furthering the rule of law. Um, uh, I don't know a single law student who uh, doesn't think that way when they start law school. Um, but the way the profession has evolved, it was always, of course, a business to a material extent, but now it is so totally a business that uh, exercising professional um, decorum, independence, and judgment has become harder. Mm. Okay, uh, let's, let's get on a more happy topic, the death penalty. Uh, so uh, uh, you have a position on a death penalty. They actually had a ruling that it was unconstitutional. Uh, uh, all right, I have, they, and, and my son is killed brutally, this, 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 this. Um, what if, what if I think if there's no death, uh, this probably isn't, but don't fight the hypothetical is that I'm actually going to kill that guy. If the, if the criminal system doesn't do justice, I know that, well, if that hypothetical, then what? Well, you're cutting closer to home than you may realize because my brother, my older brother was murdered in cold blood uh, uh, when he was 42 years old. Uh, and if you had asked me then about the death penalty, I would have said, uh, bring it on. Um, and let's start with this guy who killed my brother. Um, uh, and I do think that 
opponents of the death penalty, and I am an opponent now of the death penalty, should not be oblivious to the genuine feelings, not just of revenge, but of moral outrage uh, that are legitimately felt by the victims of the family of someone who was murdered. Uh, the reason I became a opponent of the death penalty um, and in the end believed that the law compelled me to hold against it um, was the number of innocent people who have been wrongly convicted uh, and either sent to their death or placed on death row. Uh, and we all owe a huge debt uh, to Peter Newfeld and Barry Sheck at Cardoso Law School who founded the Innocence Project and used DNA to prove that literally hundreds of people who have been given the death penalty uh, were actually factually innocent. Um, and so I became an opponent of the death penalty because of that risk. How can we send someone to their death when two years later, we may find out through DNA that that was the wrong guy. Um, so, um, and I so held an opinion that was promptly reversed, but I still think was right. Um, and I actually think will ultimately become the law of the land. Okay. Uh, when? <laughs> when will it become the law of the land? The, uh, well, I have one clear convert, which is Justice Breyer. I think that though, although they have not been as outspoken on it, Justice Sotomayor and Justice Ginsburg agree with me. Um, so it wouldn't take that much of a change in a new administration, who knows? Um, uh, the, uh, who would have thought 50 years ago or even 30 years ago that the Supreme Court of the United States would recognize gay rights as a fundamental right. I mean, that's a huge change that's occurred in our lifetime. Um, so these changes can occur. Um, most of the countries of the world have long since outlawed the death penalty. And I think the United States will eventually come along. But they're gonna do that judicially rather than through Congress or anything else. I think so because it's too, I think, politically sensitive to, to be accomplished uh, otherwise. Okay. Uh, you also have a, opinions on the federal sensing guidelines. Um, and, uh, you know, I was there clerking uh, before these. Uh, and some people would say to me, well, actually, you know, it was interesting because in part one, uh, if you, one of the ways you could help get a settlement with a defendant was to say, okay, I'll bring it as an information in part one before Judge Lasker, who was going to then give a predictably lower sentence. Uh, and people said, well, in Utah, they're getting this, here they're getting this, and even in the Southern District, it could be a crap game. Don't we need some sort of regularity? What about that thought? So there's no question that there is disparity among judges uh, when they are free to give whatever sentences they feel is just. The trouble is not that that isn't a problem. The trouble is that in attempting to cure that problem, you have created much bigger problems. Uh, first, we have imposed a regime which consists of mandatory minimums, career offender statutes, and uh, sentencing guidelines, which are not mandatory, but which are uh, still um, uh, highly suggestive, that take no account of the individual human being uh, who is before you for sentencing. Uh, in my experience, there are huge differences between why someone uh, committed a crime, how they were led to uh, commit that crime, and a whole host of other factors that used to weigh very heavily with judges 
now have uh, no place at all in the system that we've put in place. Secondly, with respect to the guidelines in particular, because they are arithmetic, they play, tend to place the greatest weight on things that can be measured. So in white collar cases, for example, 70% of the calculation of the guideline range is determined by the amount of loss because that can be measured. In drug cases, 70% of the calculation of the guideline range is uh, a function of how much, uh, how many grams or kilos of drugs were distributed because that can be measured. Uh, so not only have we done away with inquiries into individual history and responsibility, uh, but even within uh, uh, more abstract factors, uh, uh, we have focused just on one or two. Uh, and that leads to very irrational, unfair sentencings. Finally, because the sentencings have become so draconian, and because judges don't have a choice in many cases but to impose them, the real determination of sentence occurs in the prosecutor's office. Because now, unlike the situation that you described in the old days where you could offer someone a more lenient judge, now you can say, Mr. Defendant, instead of the 20 year mandatory maximum that I will get if I convict you at trial, if you agree to plead guilty immediately, I will give you a five-year mandatory minimum. Some other uh, AUSA in the same office will say, I'll give you a 10-year minimum. Some AUSA in another district will say, uh, I'm only willing to give you a 15-year minimum. Huge disparities that are totally secret, not known to the public, not seen by anyone because they're all a function of negotiations uh, in the back room in the prosecutor's office. So there is, in my view, just as much disparity as there used to be. It's just that it's hidden, but we have paid a huge price for trying to do away with it. Namely, we have developed an inhumane, impersonal form of sentence. How can we correct it? The best way to correct it would be to do away with mandatory minimums, career offender statutes, and the sentencing guidelines. And that may yet happen because of mass incarceration. Congress, by a bi large bipartisan majority two years ago, um, passed the what's called the First Step Act, which reduced some of the mandatory minimums. Um, it was only a first step as the act itself says, uh, but it shows that people were beginning to become aware of just how harsh and unfair the system of sentencing is. Uh, but that would be, the, 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 those steps would be the best. Short of that, um, in certain cases, judges can uh, avoid mandatory minimums through what's called the safety valve. Uh, in certain cases, they can always avoid, if they wish to, the sentencing guidelines because they are now discretionary rather than mandatory. Um, we're talking, of course, here in the federal system, the same problems exist in the state system where most crimes uh, are prosecuted, but whether the guidelines are mandatory or uh, discretionary varies from state to state. So there's that wrinkle as well. Um, the, but to my mind, the only um, really dispositive solution would be to do away with mandatory minimums, do away with career offender statutes, do away with sentencing guidelines. The, um, and that will lead to sentences where there are some disparities. You'll go back and the, the judge, you mentioned Judge Lasker, a very great judge who was known for giving very lenient sentences. There were other judges in the same court who were for the very same crime and the same individual who give a harsher sentence. That's not a, that's not a good thing, but, it, but correcting it is too hard.
I think Judge Weinfeld was one of the more serious. Uh, so the other, right in the same court, you had people. Uh, so would you say prosecutors, if you, if you just had all the prosecutors, and we'll just do federal prosecutors, are they happy with the current system because it gives them more discretion or do they have any of the concerns that you have? They don't have the concerns. There are exceptions, of course, but by and large. I have a proposal there that I am quite confident will never be adopted, but would solve that problem, um, which is that every prosecutor, state and federal, should spend six months out of every three years representing as a defense lawyer indigent defendants in another district where there wouldn't be any conflicts because it'd be totally unrelated cases. Um, the, uh, that's essentially what goes on in Great Britain. In Great Britain, barristers try all the cases, present all the cases at sentencing, um, and uh, a barrister can be a prosecutor in one case and the very same afternoon, as I personally witnessed um, when I was in England, can be the defense counsel in a different case. And the result is that they get to see both sides and they have a much more balanced view of what is fair in, in, in the system. Uh, what happens in the American system is prosecutors typically not fresh out of law school, only a few years out of law school. They are rightly imbued with their the important public purpose they solve. Uh, and they get to see the bad side of every defendant they look at, and rarely the good side. And the uh, uh, if my proposal were adopted, they would have a more balanced uh, view. I first proposed this many, many years ago to then Attorney General uh, Levy of the Ford administration. Uh, and he, uh, and this was in a little question and answer uh, program that there were many people there. And he said, well, Mr. Rakoff, that's not a wholly bad idea, not wholly bad. <laughs> and I slunk away. Uh, but I still think it's a good one. Well, he actually, it sounds like, you, you know, he's condemning you with faint praise or whatever, but the he actually might have thought that was a compliment, old school guy. I mean, <laughs> that's those things. All right, so I'm looking at your thing. I don't know how you do all this. I, I think most of, most of this must be wrong. You produced five books, 40 articles. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, but many more than 40 articles. Uh, you're probably looking at an old version. Five books is still the, the number of books, but the uh, it's now up to uh, 150 articles. Holy moly. Now, where are you getting all oh, before you answer this question? And you're also teaching, unfortunately, at a lesser law school, Columbia Law School. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, we do the best we can. <laughs> as an adjunct, and uh, how... Do you teach every semester, once a year? What do you teach? I teach, uh, this, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but here's the facts. In the fall, I teach two seminars, upper class seminars, weekly seminars at Columbia, and one upper class seminar at uh, NYU Law School. In the spring, I teach first year criminal law at Columbia Law School, and a weekly seminar at NYU Law School. So I teach three days a week. How do you do that if you're a full-time district court judge or pretty much a full-time? Um, I really love it. And um, my brother, my younger brother, is a law professor. And he has, over the years, uh, made me realize what a thrill that profession is. Um, even a kaji old guy like Hugh Hansen probably feels that way. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, to have the opportunity to participate with bunning soon to be lawyers and uh, helping them to appreciate uh, what I honestly still think is the beauty of our legal system for all its faults. Uh, 
is is something uh, I find very very rewarding. Uh, and then there's the added advantage. Um, I only get home late, so my wife doesn't have to put up with me as much as she otherwise would. Uh, so she's undoubtedly grateful for this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would think that she might say, Jed, a little less them and a little more me, but she's so sweet she probably doesn't even say that. Or even more, what she should be saying is a little less them and a little more cleaning up the basement. Uh, but uh, uh, you're right. I've escaped because I have a sweetheart for a wife. So, uh, okay. You're training foreign judges, like seven or eight, <coughs> of the U.S. Department of Commerce. What is that all about? So that, of course, has been put on hold by the pandemic. But it was. It's a great program, and I hope it will come back. Um, this was developed uh, about beginning about 20 years ago by the Department of Commerce, which was asked by various foreign countries that had had problems attracting as much foreign investment, why are we having these problems? And the Department of Commerce said, gave several reasons, but one of the reasons they gave was, your judges don't understand international commercial law. They may be great judges, but they're uh, very unfamiliar, given the background of your particular country, with international commercial law. And that needs to be uh, accentuated. And the foreign countries then, in many, many cases, said, well, can you send us some folks to help train our judges on international commercial law? So that's the program that the Commerce Department has been running for 20 years. And typically, I've, I've now had the good fortune to assist them in many, many countries, but particularly in the Middle East. Um, and the, uh, typically, what we will do is we will have a panel uh, for over a period of three, four days. Uh, the audience. Uh, will be maybe 20, 25 judges from uh, various courts in a given uh, country. Uh, the panel will be uh, a uh, law professor from the United States well-versed in international uh, law, a law professor from the local country very well-versed in their local statutes and uh, methodologies, um, uh, one or two practitioners, and then a judge, and I'm the judge. Uh, and what I try to, this is a partly substantive teaching. We teach them about various international conventions, uh, but also it's partly just giving them a feel for how international commercial law has its own aspects that may not be uh, well known if they've only been doing domestic cases. Um, I'll give you just one example. The most countries in the world, except for those that are former British colonies, have what's called the civil law system, which means everything is statutory. Uh, and when a judge gets a case in one of these countries, they immediately go to their what they call the code, the collection of statutes, and they try to figure out what's the right statute that fits this particular issue. In international commercial law, the law grew up starting in and around the 1300s through informal customs that were carried out by various shippers and eventually by various monarchs. Uh, and uh, a lot of that early law was customary and still is. Some of it has been put into statutory form, but you don't really understand the statutes if you don't know the custom, the customary law that it, it attempts to embody. Likewise, a surprising amount of 
international commercial law is a function of UN conventions. These are really treaties of sorts, but are developed by the United Nations and then signed on to often by hundreds of countries. And uh, they, again, are operate differently. They often have a custom, a history of customary law that led up to them that is in effect embodied within them. Um, and so for someone in a civil law country, like Iraq, one of the countries so so, or Bahrain, uh, these are, uh, uh, or Bosnia, these are countries where the judges, good as they are, are not used to that kind of law. And so the point of this program is to teach as much as we can about how to deal with that kind of law. Well, that's fantastic. And it's kind of amazing just in this time, how many different things you've done, which have just been fantastic. Uh, I, th I think the word is compulsive, but anyway. No, but uh, thank you so much for agreeing to be on this podcast. Uh, it's been a delight and uh, you are a delight. And your marriage is a delight. I mean, the whole thing is just delightful, frankly. Well, well I'm, I'm so lucky uh, and not least to have such good friends as the very admirable Hugh Hansen. Uh, so anyway, thank you very much. And uh, okay, so that's it for now, everybody. Uh, I wanna thank Jed for coming. I think it's been fantastic. Um, and uh, Jed, thanks again. My it's my pleasure, really.